<laughs> Welcome to Shannon's Club TV, the show for Shannon's Club members and all motoring enthusiasts to indulge the passion we all share for cars and motorcycles. And if you're joining us at the club room for the first time, we examine what made these cars successful on Australian roads and racetracks. We'll also road test a beautifully preserved example of each car and talk to its proud owner. We'll then get some expert advice from the Shannon's auction team on current values and market trends. Now, let's take a look at how Australia ended up building the world's most advanced family car at the time, the fin-tailed Mercedes-Benz 220 series. It's hard to believe that from 1959 until 1964, Mercedes-Benz passenger cars were built in Australia with significant local content. Volkswagen, Borgwood, Porsche and even Gogamobile had become part of the local motoring scene and left Australians wanting more German cars. Yet the more expensive and desirable Mercedes-Benz range struggled under tough local import laws. By the early 1950s, Mercedes-Benz was dominating gruelling motorsport events such as the Carrera Panamericana, and was ready to expand its global reach in the passenger car market. Mark, how important was this racing background to the cars that Australians would soon be offered? Well, it was enormously important if you think about it. You know, Mercedes-Benz racing its sports cars in Europe, like the 300SL, the Gullwing, and those derivatives, those guys were really pushing the envelope in terms of overhead cam engines, you know, fuel injection, independent suspensions. This endurance racing technology translated so well to these cars being used in Australian conditions. Mercedes-Benz could not exploit the growing Australian demand for its cars by assembling SKD or semi-knockdown kits like its rivals. It could only ship CKD or completely knockdown kits. These dictated a much more sophisticated local outfit at the receiving end to build the latest Mercedes bodies from scratch as well as support the advanced mechanicals. The Australian operation that built and sold the standard Vanguard had those skills and falling Vanguard sales had left a gap to fill. Vanguard distribution also overlapped the target Mercedes-Benz market with its strong rural presence. Australian Motor Industries was formed in 1958 to build and sell both. By the end of 1959, the Finney, or Fintail, 220S, entered local production. It was quickly followed by the 220SE with its groundbreaking fuel injection. Buyers and admirers struggled to find enough superlatives to describe this striking new model, and unbelievably, it was built in Australia. And even if it did cost the same as two Holdens and a Volkswagen, it didn't matter. The Finney style, its use of space, its ride, its performance and economy, and the cleverness everywhere you looked were a new experience. Well, the rest is history, almost. By 1964, AMI had to surrender its share in local Mercedes-Benz operations despite record sales, so it could fund the switch to Toyota for its volume range. Mercedes-Benz went its own way as an import, and because Australians were now happy to pay a premium for a premium range backed by a stable factory network, Mercedes-Benz never looked back. Mark, there was at least one motorsport event in Australia that mm. played a huge role in proving beyond doubt that the 220 Finney was the finest four-door sedan that Australians could buy for tough local conditions. Yeah, and it couldn't have been any better timed with local manufacturing well underway. Still to come, we'll take a look at a beautifully preserved Mercedes Finney and meet its proud owner and get the latest updates from Shannon's auction team with Hammer Time. The Armstrong 500 mile race at Victoria's Phillip Island Raceway was conceived as the ultimate test of stock standard road cars under the stress of competition. So for Bob Jane and Harry Firth, the 220 SE Fintail was an inspired choice for the 1961 race. At the time, a fleet of factory prepared 220 SEs was dominating the European rally scene, as nothing could match the six cylinder Finney's combination of fuel injected engine efficiency, supple long travel independent suspension, sure footed handling and tank tough construction. These attributes were ideally suited to the brutal nature of the Phillip Island circuit in those days, which was plagued by a brittle track surface that would turn into a minefield of windscreen shattering rocks and tyre puncturing potholes each time the race was held there. Joe, given the roughness of the Phillip Island track, the Australian public, they really could not have asked for a more relevant demonstration of a car's engineering quality than the Armstrong 500. 
you know, given that it reflected the poor standards of roads that many drove on in those days? Well, in actual fact, Phillip Island Racetrack was probably, even in its worst state, was probably better than most local roads. <laughs> and if you're spending two and a half times the price of a Holden on a mm. car, your investment mattered. And uh, knowing that it could drive like that flat chat and last the distance, uh, in other words, the money that you'd put into it, it was a huge verification or validation of that car. Ironically, it was the Jane Firth Mercedes-Benz that struck trouble early in the race when Bob pitted with a flat tyre after only two laps. Now, under the rules, he had to get out and change the tyre himself, which took more than five agonising minutes and put him two laps behind the outright leaders. However, during the next eight hours, Jane and Firth fought their way back into contention with a masterful display of driving that balanced high speeds with mechanical sympathy to preserve the car and its vulnerable tyres on such a treacherous track surface. The tactic, combined with fast and efficient pit stops, allowed the Mercedes pair to not only gain a stranglehold on their Class B lead, but also overhaul the Class A Studebakers and Vauxhalls to be declared the unofficial outright winners at a time when such an achievement was not officially acknowledged in the results. It was a most impressive victory for Jane and Firth and a testament to the fine handling and rugged durability of the 220SE, which made it so well suited to Australian conditions. If you're motoring enthusiasts like us, why not join the Shannons Club? Upload photos of your favourite cars, connect with other members, and have access to exclusive club offers. You can read the full road and race histories of our feature cars, and catch up on past episodes of Shannons Club TV on the club website. My name is Frank Whitfield. I have a Mercedes-Benz 220 SB, made in 1964. This car was the first car that was fully crash tested with the safety shell where the passenger compartment is, front and rear crumple zones, the engine and gearbox going underneath the car, collapsible steering column, all the safety features that we appreciate in every modern motor car today. The motor's a six cylinder, single overhead camshaft engine, twin Solex carburetors, twin exhaust system, and a four speed synchro mesh gearbox. The car has the, my sort of interior, plenty of room, space, and comfort. The twin bucket seats are delightful to sit in. It's just well appointed, wonderful vision, front and rear, sideways. You just wouldn't want a better lounge room. This is the original sales document of the car, bought by Mr. Reg Fagg. Last year I had the privilege of exhibiting the car at Motor Classica. It was wonderful to be invited and participate. I have an affection and a passion for all Mercedes-Benz. Just the quality of the car, the ride, the driving ability, everything about them, the appearance, and the three-pointed star is a great thing to follow. We're back with Hammer Time, talking to Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borovan. Chris, the Mercedes Fintail 220 Series. The absolute zenith of passenger cars in 1960. Mm. Almost unloved, neglected, yet there's a bit of movement going on now. What's happening? Mm. It did live in the shadows of ESLs and ESC coupes for a while, uh, but we're seeing now through the club movement some really good, strong interest. And uh, again, amongst amongst the young people, also we're seeing a bit of a retro chic coming back in with them. So good following for them again. We've seen a few come through the auction house uh, now, making good prices. So it's an incentive for people to start restoring them. So they're on the upward move right now. Look, I think they are good original cars, good history, books. Uh, yeah, they're they're fetching a good dollar. So what's the typical buyer demographic for this kind of car? I mean, uh, you talk about the, the retro chic, and there's obviously young buyers there, but are, are there older buyers who are perhaps collecting these cars or remembering what they were like when they were new? We are seeing some of the collectors, the Merc collectors, adding the, uh, the Finneys to their collection. Mm. Uh, and obviously, I think it's a car that can be taken out uh, as we're family or friends. Yeah, very uh, practical. Going on, a, on a great club yeah. run or club weekend. A practical car. Mm. I think, Chris, what might have hurt them a little is that the Australian cars weren't very well rust-proofed and it's a very mm. complex body. 
and it takes a lot of money to unstitch them and, and fix them up. Is that, are the values yeah. now reaching the point where people can start doing that? It's now becoming justifiable for people to start restoring the finnies. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if you if you had to go and spend the money in the old days, you'd probably look at restoring an SL or an SE coupe first, uh, right. because they're obviously worth a lot more money. Uh, but I think now with the uh, with the finnies coming up in value, uh, I think we are seeing a few more people throwing some money at the finnies now. That's good. Mm. And do you think they're coming up in value because of a lack of, of availability of the coupes, or they're just in their own right? Look, I think in their own right as well. They're, they're quite a pretty car. Mm. Uh, the styling, Beautiful. the styling was yeah. great, and there's not many left. No, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, thanks for joining us, Chris. And keep in mind, all the latest Shannon's auction information is available on the Shannon's Club website. If you want a lasting memory of the Mercedes 220 SE Fintail in action, head to autopix.com.au, where you can browse Autopix archive of over 760. Thousand photographs. And you can read the full road and race story of the Finney on the Shannon's Club website. Well, Joe, I guess when you look at the 220 SE, it was you know, a fantastic car when it first came out, but it just seemed to, to disappear after a few years. What actually happened is that it was around for quite a long time. Mm. Um, Mercedes Benz turned it into the entry model when the new 250S, 250SE came out, mm. and it sort of went out as being a, a, a poor relation and uh, before the new compact range came out in 1968. So mm. it, 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 it had a shadow period there for a while. It was a bit sad to see that, that sort of decline, but now, all these years later, it's a very, very desirable classic again. Well, we, people don't remember that in-between in period yeah. and remember the highlights of it, which we've just covered. It's just mm. a fabulous car. Fantastic car. Mm. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this trip down memory lane with the fabulous Mercedes-Benz 220SE. We look forward to your company on the next episode of Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.